So for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we used to do shows on the Name United Fan Con. That's our company name, and now we're doing a multifaceted show called New England Fan Experience. And I appreciate you all coming. And I'd like to bring out our first celebrity guest for the day. I don't know how many people are aware of this. How many Doctor Who fans do we have? So what happened this weekend, 45 years ago? Doctor Who started, right? Yeah, on Sunday, this Sunday, the 23rd of November, will be the 45th anniversary of Doctor Who. So what better way to celebrate the anniversary of Doctor Who than bringing a doctor to Boston? So get your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Peter Davison, the fifth doctor from Doctor Who! Ah, uh, I feel like I'm going to break into song or something. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Boston, although yeah, it's actually me that just arrived in Boston, so I don't really know why I'm welcoming you. But hi, how are you? Jolly good. Nice to see you. Um, I don't know now what form we're meant to take here, but I suppose maybe I should take a question just to, to uh, see if we can get the proceedings going. Or would you like just my life history? Hello, yes. <laughs> Uh, well, what am I doing now? Very good question. Um, since I left, I was in the uh, production of um, Spamalot in the West End until, <laughs> until March. I was, uh, uh, I was King Arthur. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. It was brilliant. It was, I, uh, um, because I, I'm, I was born about the time when I was, you know, Monty Python was around. I was about 18, when, I think, when it started. And, um, I just liked, and this was the nearest I could possibly come to, uh, to actually playing... Being, being in Monty Python. Uh, so I, I loved it. And they actually, when they auditioned me for the part, you haven't actually asked this question, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Because um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, I, went, I went for a couple of, two or three auditions in, in, in London. And then I heard nothing for about sort of six weeks. And I was kind of disappointed because, you know, I, I thought I, this, was, this was at least, at the very least, a musical, a West End musical in which I could possibly star. Because I'm not, I'm really not a musical song and dance person in any shape or form, as you can probably tell. Um, but anyway, I, I heard nothing. And then they rang me up. Uh, I was having to decide about between two jobs that weren't particularly special. And my agent rang up and said, oh, um, would you mind very much if they flew you first class to New York so you could uh, audition for the, uh, uh, um, do a final audition on the Broadway stage uh, um, for Spamalot. And I said, well, I don't mind terribly. I suppose, <laughs> you know, I suppose I could put myself out to, uh, to fly, be flown first class to New York. Um, and uh, so they, that's what they did. Uh, and they flew me there and uh, they put me up in this fabulous hotel. And then in the morning, I, uh, I, I went along for the audition, I think about 9.30 or some ridiculous hour. And uh, the, the audition lasted for about 20 minutes. Um, and, and, and it was an audition which I, 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 I made a complete mess of, I have to say, because uh, I, I was very, I was quite, you know, I was quite nervous. I was on the Broadway stage and, you know, the director of the original production was there and uh, uh, they, he said, well, what would you like to do? Would you like to do a scene first or would you like to, to uh, uh, sing a song? I said, well, I'll try singing the song because that was my biggest nightmare. So I started off in the wrong key and then went, oh, bugger. Which was actually quite Monty Python-ish. I think he rather liked that. <clears throat> um, and then, so I made a bit of the, uh, a bit of a hash of the, the interview, the actual scene a bit as well. So I went away thinking, you know, I, th there's no way I've, I've got this part. Uh, but I had about five hours to kill, so I went shopping in New York. And I was looking around all this thing and thinking, God, if only I, if only I uh, uh, you know, had the part. I knew I had the part, I could spend lots of money, uh, uh, you know, before I go back. And then I got a phone call from my agent saying, you've got the part. So I just went, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so anyway, but I, I love doing it and I did it for about seven months, I think, in the end. Uh, and since then, I've done, um, since I left, I think, which is in February, uh, I've done a Midsummer Murders. Have you ever heard of Midsummer Murders? It's, it's a really a, a ridiculous program. Uh, uh, it's about, no, it's great. I love doing it. And it's a, he it's a heck of a lot of fun. But it is, a story, it is a series, which has now been going for about, I don't know, nine years or something like that. Something like that, a long time. And it's all set in one sleepy English country village in which there is at least a murder 
if not two murders a week. <laughs> and no one seems to have noticed <laughs> that it must be the murder capital of, of Great Britain. You know, it's a, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like Murder, She Wrote, you know, where the last thing you're ever going to do is invite that woman for the weekend. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, it's insane. I think in my episode, there were three murders. Uh, um, one of which was me, I have to say, I don't want to give the game away. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and then I've just done a series called Unforgiven, uh, which uh, goes out after Christmas, and there will possibly be a, another series of that. It's, it's, a, it's a rather, well, it's a good story, actually, about someone who's, who's uh, been in prison, a girl who's been in prison for 16 years for murdering two policemen and how she gets out and things aren't quite what they seem anyway. Uh, so that comes out after Christmas. I'm not going to give the end of that away though. Uh, uh, then that's me up to date. I'm sorry, shall I go now? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. How did you feel about having your daughter Georgia? How do I feel about Georgia? Yes, my daughter Georgia uh, is in the newest season of... Um, of uh, the new Doctor Who, or whatever you call it. I don't know what they call it now. Doctor Who. We are now, we're now categorised as the classic series. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, that is, I think it's fantastic. You know, uh, uh, she, I think she, it's been blown out of proportion, really. Originally, when they were casting for the original companion, this is back, back in Chris Eccleston's time, they saw my daughter, but she got nowhere near getting the part. She just was seen as one of many, many, many other actresses who went up for the part. And then she went up for a, uh, another part in, in, in the, the, you know, the last series uh, last year, and uh, they, they offered her the part. <coughs> and um, then they and she was very pleased. She rang me up and said, "I've got a part in Doctor Who. It's a really nice little, little part. It's not huge, but it's a nice part." Uh, and uh, I said, well, "That's fantastic." And then they rang her back about two days later, and said. Um, we're very happy if you take this, this part that we've offered you, but if you just hang on for four months, there's a better part coming up down the line. And she was a bit torn because, you know, she think, you know, people make promises and maybe it wouldn't work out in the end. So she was very torn. In the end, she decided to kind of trust them and, and wait for the later part, which they said, I think they described it as being, for many reasons, absolutely perfect. And of course, it ended up being called the Doctor's Daughter. So I suppose there was a kind of uh, there's a kind of symmetry there. But uh, she had, in fact, got another part, which was a, a, th a thing in an earlier um, program, which she didn't end up doing. So yeah, no, I think it's great. I, th I, I, you know, she's never allowed me to give her any advice with regard to acting. But oddly, she does she does take my um, convention advice. <laughs> <laughs> which I think, is quite, I think is quite important. So I've actually done a, con in Britain, just a sort of a day, one of those day events, I've done a couple of conventions with her. Uh, it's quite fun. Yeah. Yes, sir. Pleasure. The Tomorrow People. <laughs> yeah. Were you really embarrassed? Yeah, no, well, no I, I'm the one. I appreciate I'm the one who should have been embarrassed about the Tomorrow People, I know. At the time, yeah, she was. Well, the thing is this, you know, um, I, this was the first telly I had ever done. The Tomorrow People was the first t TV uh, thing I ever did. And um, in those days, nothing, especially on ITV, it was an ITV program, and things just were never repeated on ITV. And in those days, there was no such thing as videotape. So you just thought, I'll do this thing. It is acutely embarrassing, but no one will ever see it again. <laughs> and I think the opening shot was with, 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 with me in sort of lycra swimming trunks or something, and a blonde curly wig. Um, I looked just like my sister. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I did it, and, and you know, it, and it was fun because it was... Uh, it was my first telly, and I was doing a very bad American accent. Um, well, actually, it was all right, but anyway. Uh, I, I, but I never thought it would ever be seen again. And then I think I was doing a, a convention over here about 15 years later, probably. And someone said, oh, we just saw you in the Tomorrow People. And I thought, oh, what? <laughs> and uh, I, think it was on, uh, I think it was on Nickelodeon or something. I said, yeah. And... Um, so then it's, it's haunted me ever since. 
I, and, I, and I attempted to exorcise it by actually doing the commentary on the DVD release of The Tomorrow People, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a very, you know, it was a, it was a very much, whereas Doctor Who was never made under the auspices of the children's TV, children's drama, this very much was. You know, it was ITV's answer to Doctor Who, but it wasn't ever a kind of really, I think, you know, it's a bit of a silly program. Yeah, did you? Good, good. The tragic, the, the really sad story about that, in the end it wasn't sad, but um, when we did it, the, I don't know if you've ever seen any other episodes of The Tomorrow People. Oh yeah, great. Well, when we did it, it was very much a departure from uh, uh, the previous Tomorrow People stories, which were kind of fairly sort of melodramatic, straight dra drama thing. And ours really was a comedy, if you like. And um, the existing cast loved doing it. The director loved it, the producer loved it, the writer loved it. And I remember after, when we went in the bar afterwards, after we'd finished recording, the writer said, I've, I've already got a great idea for the ne you know, next story where you come back, you know, the return of, of Elma, etc." And we were kind of really excited, like, yeah, we're gonna get, I'm going to get another job out of this. And everyone was up for it. They spoke to my agent about it and when, when they might do it in the next season. And then it went out on television and the children hated it. <laughs> they just hated it. They couldn't bear the idea of... Um, you know, at one point I think I tickled the computer and it, and it, and it laughed, you know, I sort of went, you know, that funny thing, those sort of orbs in the ceiling though, and I, and I said, wouldn't it be good if I went up and went like that, and it went, <laughs> <laughs> and we said, yes, that's a great idea, and anyway, the children absolutely loathed it, so we never did another one. Say, Levy. Yes, anybody else? No, okay, well, just in time, yes. It was, it was, it was just for the both of you. Yeah, <clears throat> it really was. Um, it was great, you know, I've, um, I, I, I'll tell you the story behind it. Uh, uh, I, I think it's no mystery to, to most people if you're fans of the program that Davison is not my real name. Anyway, uh, 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 if you know my real name, you'll also know it's similar, if not exactly the same as the next produce, producer of Doctor Who. Uh, uh, and uh, anyway, we got, to know, we got to know them quite well. I got to know Stephen Moffat quite well. And uh, they've also got two little boys, as I have, and theirs are called Louis and Josh, and mine are called Louis and Joel. So there's great sort of symmetry there somewhere. <clears throat> anyway, we, we invited them down uh, one, one Sunday, just to, you know, for, for lunch, and, and he, Stephen mentioned, he said, you know, how would you feel about coming back to do a short scene uh, for this thing called Children in Need, which is like a teleth telethon sort of thing in which, you know, various sort of people involved in programs do little bits to raise money. And I said, yeah, yeah. And, and as it happened, uh, I had in my house in the cupboard um, my jacket from top to... <laughs> in fact, I had two of them. And, and Stephen Moffat is a huge, huge fan of the series. He can... He, I mean, I don't know how he does it. If you show him a black and white picture of any Doctor Who, he can not only tell you which episode it's from, but which scene it's from in the episode. Uh, anyway, what I told him, I said, funnily enough, I was looking through the wardrobe the other day and I found these two Doctor Who jackets from way back. And he was so excited, we, we each tried one on. And there's, there's, there's a photograph which I've got of, of Stephen Moffat and myself, with both in our Doctor Who jackets. It's brilliant. Anyway, uh, uh, that's how it started, and then he sent me the script, and it, and it was a it was a brilliant little brilliant little script, I think, still think, and it was based on the fact that I was David Tennant's doctor, so you know, as I'm sure you know, it kind of if you've seen it, it works on that those two levels. You know, he's reminiscing about how it was to have been the fifth doctor, and also how it was for David Tennant to sit watching me on the television. And that's what's brilliant about it. And um, we, they wrote this scene and he said to me, it, it, we reckon it's going to last between 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, and when we came to do it, I was in Spamalot, uh, for which I had a beard. And I had to shave off my beard on a Saturday night, get in a car and be driven down to Cardiff, which is about three hours away, 
get up the following morning, and then we filmed all day, and then I drove back to London to start growing my beard again. Um, uh, anyway, we did it, but when we actually finally got on the set, we did it, we both did it, because Dave, I mean, I used to go at a fair lick in Doctor Who. David goes at a fair lick in Doctor Who, if you've seen it. Um, and so between us, I think the end scene was actually eight minutes, so we knocked four minutes off the expected time. We did it so quickly. Uh, but it was great. I thought it had extra pace, I mean, a fantastic pace, and it was directed by Graham Harper, who had directed the last, my, the last Doctor Who thing I'd done. So for me, it was like I, there was no change between Caves of Androzani and, and uh, Time Crash. Uh, <laughs> he looked a little older, but I dare say I did. Um, there is no truth in the rumor that I didn't fit into the costume, so we had to get... I, read, I don't know if you read, I read somewhere that, oh, he didn't, Peter Davison didn't fit into the costume, so they had to get Sylvester McCoy's costume in. Well, he's, a, he's a foot and a half shorter than me, and, it, and it's an entirely different costume. I mean, I don't know what they were thinking about. It's perfectly true that it was a little tight around the waist, uh, but I didn't have to cut the great big V out of it that Colin Baker, Colin Baker had to cut out of my other pair of trousers in order to fit it in at all. Um, and it was great. I, I loved doing it. Um, it, was, it was a bit of a, an odd experience because I was slightly in awe of being on... A, it was a different set. You know, it's not like doing it in the days when we did it. This is a purpose-built, what they call standing set. And it was very much a, a set that, you know, is entirely different to the old TARDIS console room. Uh, so I, I didn't feel immediately at home in it, and I just felt like it was like, you know, it was someone else's, uh, someone else's set. You know, David had his little foibles. In fact, there was, one, there, was one lee, there was one point where I had to go around pushing all these levers backwards and forwards, you know, and, and I kept pushing this particular lever, and then David had to go around pushing levers, and he kept saying, hang on, that, no, no, hang on, that lever's moved. How can, and I said, oh, that's me, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry. And he said, that's the only lever I have anything, you know, I've, I've decided what it does. <laughs> he said, you can push any other lever you want, but that one. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll leave that one to you, then that's fine. Um, but it was great, and by the time we got into the afternoon and we nearly finished it, I was really sort of settling into it. I could have done a whole lot more, but sadly we got to the end of it. But it was, I, I think, it, I, I just felt... Well, there are two things, really. One, I felt that I, we'd sort of connected the classic series with the new series in a, in a good way. Um, and the other good thing was, up until then, you know, when I, when I, sort of, when I got into the, my, my, my children's playground and, uh, to pick them up or something, and some mother would say to their child, oh, you see that man over there? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's Doctor Who, that's the fifth Doctor. And of course, they'd look at me and go, where? Well, I don't, I don't know. Surely he was slender and had highlighted hair, and it doesn't. More of it too, and, and they didn't have. Any, <laughs> so what it meant was that from that then, after it went out, time crash went out. When I went to the playground, the children recognised me for the first time. You know, they didn't. They didn't have to have it explained to them, because you know, they'd seen a lot of them had seen me as Doctor Who. Because when the main series finished, when the new series finished, they'd switch over to the other cable channels and see the old Doctors. But they don't know that, you know, they don't know that the old doctors took place 25 years ago or whatever however long ago. So they think when they meet you that you'll look exactly the same. So I was quite gratified in the end that, um, that, it, that we did it, if only so that people would understand <laughs> that time has passed, sadly. Okay, yes, in the front here. Oh, the audio books, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done the audio, bo audio books now for some time, I guess. I mean, I don't actually know when we, when we sort of started doing them, but it seems like a long time ago. Um, it, it, you know, I never made... A, 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 obviously, it's meant to be exactly the same time scale, so I'm meant to be the Doctor, because some of the stories, I think, slot into the middle of other stories that were done on the TV series, and, and others sort of stand on their own. But uh, I never made any conscious effort to either move the Doctor along, really. I just, I think I just let time that had passed take care of that. So he was, he is a bit different, I guess, uh, uh, in some respects. But, you know, I, I, I thought I wasn't going to sit down and sort of try and make him the way he was when I did it. I just sort of played it on a kind of instinct, instinctive basis. So, but I love, I like doing them. They're, great, they're good to do. 
And I think they do sort of, they filled it, because they certainly filled a gap for the fans, <clears throat> you know, because um, obviously the series wasn't on the air for some time. And they've managed to keep going and still hold the fans' interest after, you know, the, the new series restarted. But I never sort of sat down and thought, how am I going to make this different? Because I, I, I realized that in theory they shouldn't be different, but to make it more interesting, you sort of have to do something a bit different, you know, within, lim within limitations. So I sort of play it as I would, if I was in vision, I would play the doctor, slightly older and slightly grumpier. Really. <coughs> yeah, over there, sir. Well, I heard that rumor. I shouldn't think it's true. I mean, I can't really see. It doesn't seem... I mean, Time Crash was a kind of thing apart, you know, although it appeared on the DVD set, the box set. It's really... It, it wasn't in the actual program, you know, when the actual program restarted, you know, where about the Titanic coming through the wall of the TARDIS, you know, Time Crash was not part of that. So it was something apart. It slotted in perfectly well, but it was something apart. I, it just doesn't seem... I th well, I think someone would have to come up with a pretty good ruse, you know, to make it work. And I can't see it being on the agenda at the moment. I've not heard any rumour about it. No one has taken me aside and said, would you like to do? So it's a pretty sure test. I'm afraid, yes. Uh, this is a question about um, the stories with the master that I did, and do I miss working with Anthony Ainley? <laughs> I do. I mean, I, 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 you know, I like the, I like the, ma the master and the doctor have a very special kind of r relationship, really, because they're both time lords. And not to make it sound like another similar science fiction program, one has turned to the dark side and the other hasn't. Um, <clears throat> but we got there first. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, but it, no, they were fun. They were fun to do. Uh, you know, I was a big fan of the original master, who was uh, an actor called Roger Delgado, who I thought was terrific. Uh, and so Ant, uh, so Ant sort of took over in, in his footsteps, and he was great too. Anthony he was, you know, he comes from a fine tradition of uh, uh, British theatre actors, Anthony Ainley, and he was marvellous. He, he was. I tell this story with the greatest affection that he was the biggest coward in the world. For the most powerful evil man in the universe, Anthony Ainley himself was an extraordinary coward. You just had to have one tiny special effects and uh, Anthony would throw himself under the table in fear and have to, be, have to be coaxed back out. He was convinced that he was about to be blown up with bits of polystyrene. Uh, but apart from that, uh, he, was, he was great fun. Yeah, I, I, I did enjoy those bits, yeah. I, I always recognised him, though. I never... <laughs> those, those bits when he was in disguise. <laughs> yes, you, you're right. I mean, it, 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 there, is a, there is that strange thing where he's the... Uh, he's the enemy, but in the end, he can't bring himself to kill the master. Yeah, especially in the Five Doctors, you're right, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you're right, and they were explored much more, and he came back quite fairly regularly during my time, so it was great. Okay, yes, gentleman in the Hawaiian-style shirt there. Well, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's with these, with Doctor Who, uh, um, it's not so much the scripts that you, you start not to like. I mean, you, you sort of read the scripts and you kind of see in your head the potential uh, uh, or, or how exciting it could be. And then it's as you start to make the program and the inevitable kind of compromises of production uh, come in to the... To the um, you know, the, the proceedings, that's when your heart sort of starts to sink a bit. And, you know, one of those, I suppose, the, the most, the biggest one of those would be, would be time flight. Uh, where potentially, you know, you can see it's a great idea if you had 
50 million dollars. You could actually do a fantastic shots of Concord landing in that sort of wilderness that was to become Heathrow. And, but when you're trying to recreate that in a video studio that's about sort of 30 yards by 30 yards, it's not really very easy to do. So it's um, also that was made uh, as a couple of them were at the, was at the end of the season and the budget had kind of basically gone. So we ended up with sort of rather sort of rigid polystyrene monsters when we should have had something a, be a good deal better. I mean, we were always limited by that simply for on a technological basis. You know, this, we made these things before digital effects, so we were working with green screens, not with um, the sort of thing they can do now. <clears throat> but it, was, it wasn't so much this, I don't, when I used to get the scripts, the biggest problem I had was um, that John had, um, after Tom Baker, John had a sort of, um, I, I think to a certain extent, a sense of humor breakdown. You know, he didn't, he, he saw what, what Tom had been doing with some of the scripts. Actually, not so much Tom, it was a, a lot to do with Douglas Adams, who was a script editor at that time. Uh, 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 and, you know, Douglas Adams had a kind of undergraduate sense of humor, what we call in Britain an undergraduate sense of humor, slightly almost Python-esque uh, uh, sense of humor, which he would try and put little bits in. And John really didn't sort of see eye to, to eye with that, didn't like that whole thing that, that Tom Baker then sort of tried to carry on. Uh, and so when I, I, Tom left and I took over, he kind of made sure that none of that was in the scripts. And I kind of always felt that the humor was quite an important part of Doctor Who. So I would desperately try, try to put funny bits in. Uh, or just little, little kind of humorous things in. And, and so a lot of it was about the battle between John and myself on a very good natured basis, but nevertheless the battle uh, had to get little bits, little funny bits in, you know. And um, we had at the end of the rehearsal period what they call the producer's run. And I would very much gauge my success on how many bits he took out, you know. So if I had sort of, if I'd put in 15 funny bits and I got away with five, I thought I was doing pretty well. And sometimes I wouldn't get away with as many as that. But, you know, he was very much against that kind of thing. And I was very much for it. But, um, so that, that, that's the only basis, really, on which... But the scripts themselves, you know, they're kind of... It's, you know, I'm, I love science fiction, so I love the... I could see the kind of I, vision of it, but I, I kind of... I was dealing in millions of pounds, not, uh, not thousands that we actually had to make the program with. Yes, over here. Oh, I love playing Dish of the Day. Yes, yeah, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, it was uh, it was fortuitous, really, because my then wife was was in the series playing Trillion, and <clears throat> I think they um, they came in one day and they said, you know, we've got these various parts coming up, and uh, that the the produ the director said, you know, what we really need is someone well known to play this part who doesn't mind being completely unrecognizable. And I said, oh, and, and, and my then wife said, oh, Peter will do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, they then, and then there was another crisis because this is so, this is so BBC. There was then another crisis because, um, because it, the scene was, it was one scene, Dish of the Day, and I really wanted to do it. I made it clear to my agent I wanted to do it and to the producer of the program that I wanted to do it. Um, but for about a week it was uh, in the balance because they couldn't pay me a small enough amount of money. Because I'd worked for the BBC quite a lot, my fee was, for the BBC, you know, moderate, right? Quite, quite good, really. And the, the amount of money they had set aside for this part was very, very small. Now, the BBC, they have, they have three levels of payment for actors. They have your actual fee, then they have a special high, and then they have a special low. Now, a special high would be if you, if you, if you got a really good part, and, but your, the amount you'd work for the BBC didn't, didn't sort of generate the, the sort of money they should pay you. They would give you a special high, which meant that when you did your next job, your next fee wouldn't be based on the special high, it would still be based on what you would have got. Am I making any sense at all? It's complicated. Uh, but if it was a small part, they would be able to pay you a special low, which means that your normal fee would be a certain amount, but you had agreed to work for a special low. But the special low could only be a certain percentage below your actual fee. And this part, 
because it was one scene was below that. And so we had a weird situation of um, my agent saying, oh, we only want this amount of money for, 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 to, for Peter to play the part. And the BBC saying, no, we can't play, pay you that little, so we can't offer you the part. Um, and my agent would say, but no, he doesn't want that. He only wants this much. He only wants the amount of money you've got. He said, no, well, we're not allowed to play, pay him that because that's, that is below his special low. So this went on for about a week before they, we, I don't know how the heck they got rounded in the end. But there's a, on that note, there's just another story about, about the ridiculousness of that. When in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there was the, the part of the, um, the sort of the host at the restaurant at the end of the universe. You know, the, I think it was played by Colin uh, Javens in the end. Uh, anyway, they, they wanted another actor. I think they wanted, um, it's fair to say now, Jonathan Price. Uh, to pay the, pay the part. Uh, and now Jonathan Price had not really worked for the BBC very much because he'd done lots and lots of theatre. But this was a sort of major part in that episode. So uh, the producer said, we'd like Jonathan Price to pay it. They went to Jonathan Price's agent and Jonathan Price's agent said, we want, say for the sake of argument, £3,000 to play this part. And the BBC said, you can't, we can't pay him that amount of money because he's not worked very much for the BBC. Uh, and uh, uh, Jonathan Price's agent said, yeah, but, but he's a major star. Uh, so we, we think he deserves the £3,000, which is not very much money, really. And the BBC said, no, we can't pay him that because he hasn't got that, done that on his BBC sort of a CV. So they couldn't offer the part to Jonathan Price. They offered it to Colin Javens, and they paid him £5,000 because that was his fee. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, okay, love for that. That's my whinging, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is about um, making all creatures great and small and how mucky a job it was, and it was mucky. <laughs> um, I'm not, you know, I, I, I was born in London, so I really had no experience of um, <clears throat> living in the country or, or being a vet. And um, when, we, when I, they got, I got the part, you know, they said, you know, you will sometimes have to do what the vet does. And uh, then they told us that for the most part, vets seem to spend most of their lives with their arms up cows. <laughs> uh, or horses, or whatever they can get their arms up, actually. Um, and it seemed to be uh, uh, that the major way you diagnose what is wrong with a, a farm animal is by putting your arm up, the, the, the poor thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I couldn't really quite believe they'd make us do it. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, we're actors. <laughs> but, you know, the BBC weren't going to set aside any money for special effects. And, and um, so, <laughs> except for Robert Hardy, I think he refused to do it. But anyway, um, as far as Chris Timothy and myself were concerned, you know, we had to get in there. And in those days, nowadays I think they do it with rubber gloves, but in those days they would just literally soap your arm in hot water and then you sort of <laughs> go, up, go up the cow. And um, <clears throat> some of them liked it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so... <laughs> but now I didn't have to do it as, as much as Chris. Chris Timothy had to do it more than anyone. But when I did it for some reason, because of the nature of Tristan, the part I played, it was always much messier than, than Chris. You know, Chris used to get away with a fairly kind of easy and out job, and I was always just covered from head to foot in cow dung and all sorts of disgusting things. Um, but I remember, I know I've told this story many times, but, but you know, the, the first time I had to do it, I, it was nerve wracking. I remember the night before thinking, oh my God, I can't believe they're going to make me do this. <clears throat> and um, it was, I think, getting on into winter, we did it in the autumn. And uh, you're sort of stripped to the waist, you're on a hillside with the wind blowing, and the only warm part of my entire body was my arm, it was up the cow. <laughs> so, you know, you felt like maybe, maybe I'll just swap and put the other one up now. Just like, you know. uh, yeah, it, but you kind of get used to it, and there was, there's a certain feel, feeling of accomplishment, you know, when you've done this, because not many other actors after, for the sake of their art, stand there for hours on end with their arm up a cow. Um, 
Yeah, it was a bit mucky. I felt, I felt sorrier for the actual for the crew because especially the lighting guys who would, I, I used to say this to them, they used to have run miles of cable across um, farmyards with all sorts of cow manure and dung sitting all over it. And then at the end of the shoot, when we all went off to have a nice warm shower and lunch or whatever, they would have to clean all the cables. Ooh, it took, used to take them hours on end. Uh, but yeah, no, it, we, we used to get down and dirty, but, you know, it was fine after a while. Yes, sir. I did talk to Tom Baker before. Uh, yes, he gave me a good piece of advice, which you know, we were in the bar at the BBC, and it was very noisy, and I didn't actually hear what he said. <laughs> uh, but I, I suspect it was something very, very profound and, and, and would have served me well had I been able to say, listen. But unfortunately, it's one of those things where he said this thing, oh, no, you know, what you should do is... And I went, right, thanks very much, Tom. I was a bit too nervous to actually ask him to, re ask him to re repeat it. Uh, so I never really know what it I never know what it was, sadly. Um, but I think you learn pretty quickly what it's all about. You know, from the moment I, I started, from that evening, from the night that I did, um, you know, the last few seconds of Legopolis, really, it became apparent that it was going to be a mad scramble uh, for, for the most part, because I think I had three minutes to... I think... It, I first lay down in, the, in that kind of position in Tom's outfit at the end of Legopolis, I think at about seven minutes to ten, and we, we stopped filming at ten, and I had to assume a certain position to match up with Tom's face, or rather the, the face of the white-faced lurker, or whatever it was called. Um, and then they, they pulled me out of there and then washed my hair and applied makeup and then I had to lie down there with about 30 seconds to go before we finished filming. And John, and from the, the booth, the director said, right, just, just sit up, just sit up, and, and, and you're now the doctor. So I sat up, and uh, uh, the look on my face was simply, what have I got myself into? Uh, <laughs> which has been interpreted in many ways, but that was the real thought going through my head. What is this about? Uh, but it was great. Yes. Yes. Uh, do I wish I'd stayed on for another season? On reflection, no. Although, had I, as I think I've said before, had I made the decision, had I been asked to make the decision during my third season, I think I might well have stayed for a fourth. The, you know, the second season was a bit of a scramble. We'd been hit by a strike, uh, uh, and it just was a bit sort of, I don't know, messy in my head. And Patrick Troughton had said, do three years and leave. And I had that kind of... And I'd done a few series. I think we'd done three series of All Creatures, and I'd done three series of a comedy series that I'd made. So it just seemed a kind of neat amount of time to do. Uh, and it, it worked out very well for me. I mean, I got a job soon afterwards and managed to put that kind of the, the stigma in a way of, of playing a, a long-running character behind me. And it is, it is dangerous. I mean, Tom found it difficult simply because he'd done it for you know, so long to move away from it. It took some years before he sort of came into his own again. And it is, it's just, the, it's not the way the public, you know, make it happen. It's the, the ma program makers. Um, when I did something just after I left Doctor Who, I know there was a lot of discussion about should we cast him in this because he's just been Doctor Who. Now, thank goodness in the end they said yes, we should. But, you know, they don't, they're not sure about it. So in the end, I think it was quite good that I left. I didn't realize that I, if someone had told me that in 2008 I'd be standing up on a stage in Boston and still talking about it, <laughs> I think I would have been fairly amazed and I'm very gratified that I'm here. <laughs> ah, dear. Um, if someone had told me I'd be alive in 2008, I'd be pretty <laughs> amazed, thanks to... Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, against well, yes. No, the master was the coward. Um, let me see. Uh, um, well, <laughs> Janet was very interesting. I think ja um, Tegan was very interesting because um, she's very intelligent. Janet Fielding, very, very bright indeed. But she was sort of playing this kind of character like that. He just stood around. I don't want to be here. 
Um, <laughs> why? Why are we doing this, Doctor? Um, and she also, she also spoke at that time, weirdly. She, had, she won't mind me saying this now, but at that particular time, she, um, she was going out with this fairly obnoxious English guy uh, who didn't like the fact that she was Australian uh, and also didn't like her name, Janet. So, <laughs> so he would, so to her, uh, he only used her middle name, which is Claire. So... Um, so she, he would always refer to her as Claire, and she spoke in this rather oddly posh British accent. So she would talk like that, very much like that. And then, uh, okay, Janet, we're going from page uh, three. Okay, that's fine. Why are we here? Uh, and, she, and, she would, uh, and then she would claim that she, she'd actually forgotten how to do an Australian accent. <laughs> mm. Now, weirdly now, because when we do these, uh, these, um, these uh, DVD commentaries, you know, she speaks in a fairly broad Australian accent again now because it was just, it was just that particular time she, you know, then it all went horribly wrong and she realised the error of her ways. <laughs> but um, it, it, was a bit, it was a bit odd because she was very kind of bright and very sharp intellectually but was playing this kind of slightly odd character. Um, I, think that's about, I think that's about all. Matthew I could never make out at all. I don't know. I mean, you know he, he was... Um, <laughs> Now, he actually was exactly the same in real life as he was in the program. Okay. Uh, sorry, Matthew. At least, I'm rude, at least I'm rude to him to his face. Anyway, all right. Okay, anybody else? The question? Oh, yes, sir, here. You know, this is interesting. I've never, never quite been able to figure this out. It's about the fact that um, you know, over here, if you do a successful series, it tends to last for, well, saying seven years or something like that at least, maybe, maybe more. Over in Britain, usually series stop after three or four years. I don't think it's to do with us being smarter about knowing when to stop. It's just, I think it's just the way it is. I think, you know, we, we have soap operas that have gone on for a long time. And... and uh, um, but the idea of, well, for a start, we never sign contracts that last that long. I think the most people sign a contract for in Britain is two options. So in other words, maximum three series. So after that, it's very much up to the actor. In other words, you have to renegotiate. Over here, you, I think, sign initially for five years if not seven years sometimes, I think. I mean, that's the option, so they can make you do the series should they choose to for either five or seven years. I think I'm right about that. And also, it, it's much more of a, you know, people are much happier about being in a long-running series over here, I think. In Britain, you start to get, by the time you get to the third year, you start to get really anxious. Um, uh, uh, you know, that maybe you ought to be moving on and doing other things. Uh, in, in America, it seems to be far more, people seem far happier to have done seven years in a series. I don't, I don't know. It's, I'm not, I don't know that one is better than the other. I mean, it, depend, it depends really as a viewer on whether I enjoy the series. You know? So if, if I'm really jo enjoying an American series, I don't want the actor to turn around after three, three years or whatever it is and say, you know, uh, I don't want to do any more. Well, we have, I think, generally speaking, we have a, a, a um, I don't know if you call it welfare system. We have, a, you know, we have, we have other, other options. You know, we, there's, there's still a fair amount of theatre that goes on, and so a, a actors don't feel so pressured about And they don't see, I think it's to do with, they, they don't see the culmination of their careers to be in a, in, in a, in a long-running series. You know what I mean? I think, pe that I think we're still at the point, rightly or wrongly, where to do a play at the National Theatre or, or the RSC is, is kind of almost, uh, 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 is, you know, in some ways better than doing, being in a certainly a long-running series. Uh, I'm sure most actors would love to do, do prestigious TV series, but as far as the sort of the, sort of, you know, the run-of-the-mill programmes, a lot of actors won't even do them. Uh, um, 
you, you know, because they they just don't want to do it, and I don't, they don't see it. I mean, they'll love to do a, they'll love to do a, a a play in provincial theatre and get far more pleasure out of it than they would do from doing five years in a hospital drama series. It's just it's I'm not saying one is any better than the other. I'm really not. What the, the thing I do find frustrating over here, and it's becoming more like um, Britain. Uh, I mean, Britain is becoming more like America. Is, the, is just the lack of faith in series. You know, this inability of people to say, I, you know, the makers of programs to say, I like this series, we're gonna make it for a bit longer. So you sit down and you watch a series and then you find out three quarters of the way through it that it's been canceled uh, um, by, the, by the, you know, the, the TV people over here. And it just drives me nuts. At least they could, they could do you the courtesy of making a, a series, a, a program that ended it, so you're not left high and dry. You know, like, uh, it just drives me nuts. That it's always seemed to me, in Britain, I speak only of Britain now, but it's, it, it, it's been, it's like this in, in America as well, that what do TV exec, what do, exactly do TV executives do uh, if all they're doing is looking at ratings? Because I could, I, you know, you could run a computer program or actually just look at figures on a piece of paper and say, that, that series is not doing that well, let's cancel it. I mean, surely, if you're going to make a series, you say, I'm going to make this series because I believe it is good. You know, and if you believe it's good, I, as it's, a, like, it's a bit like that, that film, you know, build it and they will come. If you have faith in a series, if you think it's good, if you're any good at your job, you will be proved to be, there's a good chance you'll be proved to be right. So to give up on a series simply because it falls below a certain marker, just like that. If you think it's a good series, I mean, I, just to, off the top of my head, it wasn't, you know, completely sensational, but you know, but we do it all the time. We sit down and watch Invasion, and then suddenly you find out, oh, there isn't it, it's not on anymore. <laughs> so it's gone. But any program like that, I just find it a bit frustrating that it seems to be so arbitrary. You know, if it's a disaster, I understand it, but. If you believe in it, then stick with it. You know, that's all. Okay. Uh, I don't know. There's now loads of hands. Yes, okay. Here. Yeah. Who just put that hand up over here? Oh, here. Yeah. Right. Mm, how do you get to the emotional core of a character like Doctor Who? It's actually, it is, it is quite difficult because, you know, uh, um, with most characters you play, you can go back in, uh, and say, well, He's from this kind of family, this sort of history. You know, he did this when he was growing up. When you're dealing with a time lord from Gallifrey, it's not that easy to sort of look back and see. So, I, I mean, you, you just, to me, you just, you take the essence of the character, which is, is sort of the idea of this well-meaning but flawed, in a way, character. I mean, he is, a, he is in his way as much as a rebel as the master. Um, but he is, he has a sort of love affair with the planet Earth, if you like. And he, he is well-meaning and he, uh, uh, he means well, sometimes it goes wrong, sometimes he doesn't do the right thing. Um, but his intentions are always, are always um, right. Uh, and you just sort of develop it from that, you know, the, uh, uh, someone with not exactly extraordinary powers, but is, uh, uh, um, you know, certainly means to achieve things, who is forever trying to repair the mistakes of others or indeed the, the mistakes he's made. I find it quite, in the end, quite gratifying, actually. Um, you know, because he doesn't carry a gun, he's not violent, he doesn't fly all over the place, but uh, sometimes the uh, chaos he creates is worse, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, lady here. Well, oh, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, well, my favourite doctor would still have to be Patrick Troughton because he was a doctor I grew up with. Um, uh, I do think that... No, I, I, this is interesting, isn't it? Because you get Doctor Who over here, don't you? The new series of Doctor Who. But it's not that popular or something, is that right? Right, you can take it or leave it. But you like Torchwood, somebody told me. <laughs> I don't understand that. You don't like Dotty, but you like Torchwood. <laughs> Come on, it's a new world. You have a new president. Get on with it. Um, <laughs> Torchwood? <laughs> All right, okay. Um, 
No, I think it should. I think it's good. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I've not, I must admit, although, I, you know, I love, like, Torchwood is not my favourite, it's sort of tokenism saves the world, but... Um, Anyway, uh, Doctor, uh, no, I think David, or my point was before I went on, I think David Tennant is fantastic as a doctor. I do think he has sort of amazing energy and, I, and he's sort of, uh, I think he's, he's terrific. Uh, but my favorite doctor, I suppose, would still have to be Patrick Troughton because that's who I grew up with. Yeah, okay, a lady at the back with the glasses on the head. Oh, The Last Detective, yeah. I said, yes, I love doing The Last Detective. I don't know if we're going to do any more. I doubt it. It doesn't look very likely, but um, I very much enjoyed doing it. It's about, it's, it's a sort of antithesis of um, uh, policemen who leap over the bonnets of cars and run around with sort of, you know, uh, sort of guns and start beating people up, which it seems almost always far more believable in America, but in Britain it's just ridiculous when they do that kind of like super sleuth, you know, brilliant detective. So I just wanted to make a series about an ordinary policeman who, in terms of really uh, the view of the police even now, would be termed a failure, but actually was a very, very good, just a good policeman. Um, uh, and he always actually did get his man in the end. I mean, that's always a thing where you have to suspend belief because if you look at The Last Detective, he, he does always solve the crime but never gets any credit. It's weird. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I just, I, I very much enjoyed doing it. it and it was set in London, which is rare for, um, you know, a series. We actually filmed it in Wilsdon, which is not a great part of London. And the irony was that quite often, unlike Midsummer Murders, where there would be two or three murders every week, in a village that would, has probably not seen a village a murder for maybe 200 years, when we would film in Wilsdon, the last detective sometimes wouldn't even have a murder. And we would be filming in Wilsdon. And every, everywhere we'd go, we'd see these yellow police signs that say, on Saturday the 19th, a murder was committed. If you saw anything, please phone. So, so we were filming in a place where there was about four murders a week. And uh, we never had one. <laughs> we did, we did, but we didn't have a, a, one every week. So, but we, we had a nice time doing it. It was a very nice cast, and I'm um, still in touch with them. So, never know, maybe there will be more. Um, yes, sir, uh, yeah, in the red, yeah. Um, okay, that's a very good question. I've been... Uh, <laughs> they're, they're mostly American. I, I've been mostly... No, not Torchwood. <laughs> no. I mostly watch American t uh, series, actually. As you, as, is, as you probably guessed by me watching them, they disappear. So, so far, I've been, uh, watched Battlestar Galactica. I, I like that. But I'm a bit confused, you know, because it, it, there's going to be another series, isn't there? Is it going to carry on from where we got to, or is it going to go back? So that was the end of it, when they got to this desolated landscape. Was, oh, there's more after that. Thank the Lord for that. All oh, right, but it is going to continue a bit from the point after they get here. All right, that's good. That's good. But I thought that was very good. And uh, I, I'm, I work with a guy um, who plays um, the son. You know, he was in an episode of The Last Detective. Uh, Jamie, I think it was Jamie, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, and I was talking to James yesterday, who's here, is about watching, uh, watching Heroes as well. Desperately trying to cling on to it. It's difficult, though, isn't it? Or am I just dumb? I mean, <laughs> something... What? Hang on, what's... Hang on, this is four years in the future. That's 400 years in the past. That's next year. That's last week. That's tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> hang on, let me just get this right. And when she is... She's not the same person who was blown up at the end of the last series. She's someone different, but she's the third different person that this she's been. It's not easy, is it? And then one minute, and then uh, James, I said, James, hang on. We just, last week, we went, I, when I've been watching, anyway, last week, we were four years in the future, and he had special powers. I don't know. I'm, I'm still watching it. It's good. I love it. Um, okay. <laughs> um, what else am I watching? Oh, I don't know. Lots of, but they're, they're most, I'm kind of fascinated by, um, you see, I think things have changed, you see. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, I used to come over to these things and people would say, why is British television so much better than American television? 
And, you know, there are elements of British television which are the same, but there are other elements which are just rubbish now. They really are, you know. And, and when American television, I think probably because of the, um, the pay channels, you know, because of, uh, um, probably, I'm guessing this, because of HBO and, 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 and Showtime and things like that, who now I think make pretty brilliant stuff. You know, they really do. And of course, you know, uh, there's a lot of dross. I mean, I was trying to watch, find something to watch last night. Um, so there's still a lot of stuff which I look at it and go, what is this? But there's also a lot of good stuff, you know. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, so I've also been trying to watch, and I bet this is going to be cancelled. Um, my, 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 what is it? My worst, is, my best worst enemy? What is it called? Cancelled? You see? <laughs> I've just watched four episodes of this damn thing. Oh, I'm, I, quite, I, I quite enjoy um, True Blood. I'm quite enjoying that. That's still going, is it? Thank the Lord for that. Okay. Okay, that's it really, see? See what a devotee I am? And of course then, up until November uh, 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 um, the 4th, I was watching every political program that was coming out, uh, uh, mainly The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, of course. I, yeah, that's the one, fantastic. Um, so I was having fun watching those. Uh, so it was very exciting, and I actually on the election night, I stayed, <laughs> this, I stayed up to like four o'clock in the morning, for our time. I think it was half past four in the morning until California came in. I was sitting there in my room. Anyway, so it's very exciting. So that's my viewing habits. Okay, let's shut you all up, isn't it? Uh, yes, on, on, on the aisle here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Well, he also wrote Small Creatures as well, in fact. Yeah, I did. Um, in fact, he and I were going to do a project, never came to, to fruition, um, uh, uh, based on a, it was a call, it was, I can't remember the, oh, it's Lyle Davidson, I think it was the novel, it was called a, The Night of Wenseless Lass, but we never, we never got around to getting it together. But he was great, Johnny, he was very good. He was very good. He was a kind of, he was a sort of multi-purpose BBC writer, you know, he, he, he never sort of did the prestigious stuff, but he was a good, solid sort of episode writer for, you know, either All Creatures or Doctor Who or um, many of the other series that he wrote for. And it was nice. It was sad. Yes. Have I worn you out now? Hang on, where are we? Oh, they're going to drag me off in a minute. Uh, yes, sir. Um, well, we, I, I, I liked John a lot. I mean, we, we remained sort of not, not good friends. I didn't see him very much, but we would, when we spoke on the phone or we, you know, we met at a certain event, we, we, we got him very well. I had disagreements with him because I think that he, um, I, I think his, what he was brilliant at was getting publicity for the show. I mean, he is responsible for really, I think, all this. Um, you know, he was the, the person who sort of cultivated that kind of convention thing as far as the actors in the program were concerned. So he, he was amazing at getting the show publicity. And the number of times we were in the, the you know, the papers, if a new person was coming in or, or there was a new monster, we would be there in the, on the you know, in the newspapers. Um, <clears throat> I think he was less, less, uh, um, less, had a less clear idea when it came to the actual direction of the show. I think he was too often, as far as I was concerned, and these are conversations we have with each other, uh, um, he was too often concerned with, um, uh, uh, you know, getting a, getting a name that was unusual into the show or some gimmick that would, you know, I've just been talking on a, D on a DVD thing about um, Chameleon and, uh, <laughs> and the kind of insanity of Chameleon that really summed up because they came to me. I remember early in that early in the second my second season and said, "We've got this great story coming up. We're going to get a robot that walks and will talk uh, in the program." And I said, "It doesn't exist." 
No one can do that. No one can even do that now. I mean, I'd be so impressed if a lifelike robot walked in here and walked up on stage and shook my hand. We're talking about 1983 or two. You know, such a thing was inconceivable. Um, I said, why don't we just dress someone up as a robot? or an android, wouldn't that be much better? He said, no, 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 these guys are building a robot and it will be able to, um, it'll be able to walk and it'll be able to talk on cue and that you'll be, we'll be able to have a scene. And I said, you know, I just don't see how that's going to be possible. Anyway, as, as time went along, <laughs> right up until the moment we started really, when he could still have abandoned the whole idea and cast a human dressed as a robot, he still insisted it would work. By the time we got to actually the studio, I think it could move its head, uh, and in a fairly unlifelike way. <laughs> um, but it, he, he saw the opportunity, not, not so much that it would really work in the pro context of the program, but a, a, a chance to get publicity for the show, having Doctor Who has working robot that walks and talks. Uh, but it was, it was just never gonna happen, and, but he, was, he could never quite come to terms with that. But, you know, I, I love to me was he had the best, what he believed the best interest of the show at heart. And for the most part, it worked. But there were just, uh, were sort of problem areas. But it was no big thing. I think all you're, well, all you're hearing is what went on, just the normal sort of disagreements that, come, that happen between producers and writers and directors or script editors. And that people probably feel a little more able to talk about. But I don't think it means there was some other agenda that was going on that there was really... No one was ever happy with him. I didn't hear anyone saying, ever. And uh, it was quite a good idea, but I don't know why the BBC didn't sort of go for it. Uh, they did have the opportunity to do it. Gone down really well. Uh, and we, we made it clear that you know, we were all interested in doing it. Even Robert Hardy, who's sort of getting on now, but he was very keen to do it. But um, I, for some reason, the BBC, you know, didn't want to. I don't know whether they just wanted to appear modern and not look back in that way. Sad, really. Yes? You, <clears throat> you know, there's recently been a, a controversy in the BBC <laughs> about, uh, you know, complaints about certain something that happened. You wouldn't have heard about it over the year. You had far better things to do. Um, but it, it was basically something happened on a radio programme um, uh, which would, was a mistake by the people involved, and they apologized for it. And at the time the program went out, two people complained. Uh, and then it appeared in one of our rather nasty, unpleasant tabloid papers. And then 27,000 people who never saw the program complained. And because of that, they'd never seen the program, they'd never heard of it, they didn't even see the transcript of what had, had happened. But on the basis that this newspaper had printed this stuff, they decided they would complain about a program they never listened to. <clears throat> and it would never have listened to in any circumstances. And because of that, one of these guys was fired and the other one was suspended. So it's quite clear that they do, they do take note <laughs> of everything the BBC, even things they shouldn't be taking note of, they take note of. So um, yeah, so if you've got any suggestions, I think <clears throat> they, they still go on the basis that one one phone call or one letter is the equivalent of a certain number of thousand um, listeners or viewers. Because I thought after this happened, I seriously thought, you know, why don't I then just get together a petition of people who hate various BBC programs that I don't happen to like? <laughs> you know, even though they might be very popular, like we have this terrible program which I think you've, you now have over here, which is called Strictly Come Dancing in Britain which is about celebrities doing a dance competition. And I just, sorry, even if you like it, you're wrong, it's rubbish. <laughs> Who wants to see whether the, I mean, honestly. So I thought, I bet I could go around and get together 27,000 people who hate this program. We'll send it to the BBC and presumably they'll cancel it. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, we've had, <laughs> why do you even allow Simon Cowell in your country? I don't know what, why. How come he's here? Um, well, actually, I don't know who's worse. Actually, I did watch. I watched the American uh, version of. Uh, I think it was Pop. Is it? Pop, he's on Pop Idol, is it, or something? Or American Idol? Is it that? I don't know who's worse. Actually, Simon Cowell, who's obnoxious, or the other ones who just go, "Oh, you're so great." 
I mean, well, yeah, Paul Rabdul, that's right. I mean, I don't know. So I, I just think it's sad. It's not even a reality program. You know, we've now got the absurd situation of we're making reality programs with celebrities. That doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, it's either a program about celebrities or it's a program about re sort of what real people are like. You can't have a program about real people except they just happen to be celebrities. <sighs> All right, okay, sorry. I t I, you see, I, I'm, I'm a grumpy old man, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, all right. <clears throat> yeah. Why is it we we'd always say, uh, you know, what, how come of all the programs we make, we still make quite good programs you know, in, in Britain, you know, that you've, you seem to have taken, this is the list of the, the ones I have seen, the equivalent, of, uh, uh, these are British programs, I believe, originally, but you've taken, deal or no deal, right? Please, give me a break, kick it off the air. American Idol, that's the, that's the British program. The, the strictly, what do you call it over here, the dancing thing? All right, okay, yeah, that's, yeah, British program. You seem to sit there, I don't know who does it, the, the TV executives come over and they go, am I off? I'm off, yeah. So they come over to our country, they sit right, what is the worst British programs we can steal? And I mean, there's some kind of conspiracy, really. I, that someone doesn't want to be nice to you. You take our crap and you, it's, uh, and you just have it, they shove it down your throats. I mean, say you don't want to see it. Write petitions, get it off the air, save yourselves. <laughs> okay, I've got to go, great to see you, bye-bye. One more time for Mr. Peter Davison helping us celebrate 45 years of Doctor Who here at the New England Fan Experience, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>